Welcome to this fourth lecture on the foundations of software testing. Today's central question is how to assess the coverage of our tests. We have two primary references, one by Brian Merrick on the abuse of structural code coverage measures, the other one of mine that describes alternatives to the structural measures. Some testers repeatedly make fools of themselves by saying things to programmers that demonstrate a deep ignorance of how computers and programs work. Today's lecture gives me an excuse to give you a refresher on the basics of computing, how programmers store and use data, how they execute instructions. You cannot understand structural code coverage measures without understanding these basics. I can't go into depth in this material. I have only part of one lecture. I'm hoping that for some of you, this lecture will give you a starting point to go read more about the foundations of computing. Charles Petzold's book is an excellent starting point. Petzold uses history to explain the why of many of the choices that underlie the design of computers and programming languages. It's a very readable book. You should go read it. We're going to start by considering how computers store data and do arithmetic. And that starts with how we do arithmetic. We work with a 10-digit number system. We have 10 distinct numerals, 0 through 9. We can represent any number as a power of 10 or as a sum of powers of 10. For example, 954 means 900, that's 9 times 100, plus 50, that's 5 times 10, plus 4. We use the same information when we add numbers. So when we add the 6 and the 2 in 654 plus 243, we know we're adding 600 plus 200. When we add, we can overflow a digit. If you add two one-digit numbers, sometimes you get a one-digit result, like 6 plus 3 is 9. But you can also get a result that's too big for one digit. For example, 6 plus 7 is too many for 10 fingers. We need another digit. Rather than trying to supplement our fingers with toes, let's switch to number boxes. We'll use boxes with 10 sides, labeled 0 to 9. Working with two boxes makes it possible to represent numbers between 00, 0 and 99. With four boxes, we can represent four digits. And that lets us store numbers between 0 and 9,999. Here's what addition looks like with number blocks. And here's how we deal with overflows. 8 plus 3 is too big for one block, so it becomes 11. One for the ones block and one for the tens block. 7 plus 5 would be 12, but we're carrying a 1 into the tens block, so this becomes 13. 3 for the tens block and 1 carried to the hundreds block. Everything works fine until we have a sum bigger than 9,999. If we go bigger than that, we don't have enough boxes. Computers store integers in a fixed number of digits, just like a fixed number of boxes. If we add two big enough integers together, the sum is too big to store, and we get an integer overflow. We can also represent fractions with number blocks. Along with number blocks for ones, tens, and hundreds, we could have number blocks for one-tenths, one-hundredths, and one-one-thousandths. That brings us to fixed point arithmetic. In fixed point arithmetic, we have a decimal point, but it's the same place for every number. For example, in all of the numbers on these slides, we use a decimal point to mark the boundary between the 10 to the 0 digit, that's the 1's digit, and 10 to the minus 1 digit, that's the 1 tenths digit. Fixed point arithmetic is a lot like integer arithmetic. With integers, there's a fixed maximum number of digits. They're all whole numbers, no fractions. For example, in 9999, there are four significant digits. Any number that can be non-zero is a significant digit. With fixed point numbers, we can have fractions. For example, with currency, we can have dollars and cents. The decimal point divides the dollars from the cents, where a cent is one one-hundredth of a dollar. But we still have the same number of significant digits. 99.99 is still four significant digits. With fixed point arithmetic, we can decide what range of numbers we want to look at. In effect, what we're doing is moving the decimal point, but with fixed point, we're moving the decimal point for every number. For example, here's a recent income statement from Microsoft. Their revenue is 62,484,000 thousands of dollars. This is not $62 million. It is $62,000,000. All of the numbers in the income statement are in the same units, thousands of dollars. The decimal point is still fixed but it's now between thousands of dollars and fractions of thousands instead of being between ones of dollars and fractions of ones. We can represent a much larger range of numbers with floating point arithmetic. That's because with the floating point, we can put the decimal point in different places for different numbers. So in floating point arithmetic, we represent every number with two numbers, the mantissa and the exponent. The mantissa includes all the significant digits. 
For example, here, there are 2, 3, 4, 5. To get the actual number, you multiply the mantissa by 10 to the exponent. So for example, 2.345 is the same thing as 2345, that's the mantissa, times 10 to the minus 3. Minus 3 is the exponent. Both of these have the same value. Similarly, 23.45 is the same as 2345 by 10 to the minus 2. And 2 billion, 345 million is 2345 by 10 to the sixth. We still only have four significant digits, but the range of numbers we can work with is huge. We can have numbers in the billions or trillions or quadrillions, or we can have fractions in the one billionths or the one quadrillionths or smaller. To simplify how we read floating point numbers, we use a convention. We write the mantissa with the decimal point after the most significant digits. This way, all of the differences between two numbers in their order of magnitude show up in their exponent. Let's go back to our example of an integer overflow. We still only have four significant digits, so we can't store 13,777. But we can represent 13,777 in floating point notation. We represent it as 1.378 times 10 to the fourth. We round up the least significant digit to squeeze it into a four-digit mantissa. So the mantissa is 1.378. But there's a problem. We've squeezed 13777 into a four significant digit mantissa, but where do we store the exponent? Without that, we have 1.378, not 1.378 times 10 to the fourth. The solution is to add a new box to the exponent. So now instead of storing four digits, we store five. But the first of the five digits is for the exponent rather than for the mantissa. And we actually need one more box. The problem is that the exponent can be negative as well as positive. Sometimes we multiply a mantissa by 10 to the fourth, but sometimes it's by 10 to the minus fourth. So for the last box, we store the exponent's sign. There's a constraint that you should pay attention to. Even though our numbers can span a huge range, they still only have four significant digits. That means that a number like 12344 4 will still look exactly the same once it's stored as 12340. There's no place for the last four. There is no fifth significant digit. I often pose a puzzle to my students. I give them a function that computes the square root of four, and I ask them if it would be a bug if the program reported a result of 1.999999 as the square root of four instead of two. And most of the students say, oh yeah, that would be a bug. Okay, fine, but what if we took the square root of something that really was 1.999999 and the program reported that as two? Isn't that the same magnitude of bug? Let's think about this in terms of four significant digits. Think about 1.9999, that's five digits. So if we want to store it in four, it's gonna be two. Would it be more of a bug to interpret 1.9999 as two, or two as 1.9999? How do we tell the difference? If we took the square root of 3.999, we get 1.99975. In four digits, that stores exactly the same way as 1.9999, and exactly the same way as two. So which is the bigger error? Saying that 1.99975 is two, or saying that two is 1.9999? You know, if you do the subtraction, saying that 1.99975 is two is a bigger mistake than saying that two is 1.9999. The problem is that floating point arithmetic contains a fundamental limitation. Our calculations have rounding error. So after a floating point operation like square root, we can't tell the difference between 1.9995, 1.9999, 2, or 2.0004. We adopt a convention. We write all of these as two. We round them up or we round them down. But in terms of magnitude of actual error, it's a bigger mistake to call 1.99975 two than it would be to call two 1.9999. Our challenge is that with floating point, we can't tell what the real difference is because we can't store enough digits.